Hip-hop since 1987.com. How you doing, Hip Hop Since 1987 family? It's Eric Hennigan, AKA E Money, here with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, Sister Tahira. And um, first and foremost, I just like to say it is beyond a privilege for us to be sitting with you, and we thank you for giving us the time to have a conversation with you. So, how are you? I'm fine, and I'm on it to be able to talk to you and to talk through you to the most important generation in our sojourn in America. It's the young people of today. So I thank you for giving me that opportunity and that privilege. Yes, sir. Now you have the anniversary of the Million Man March approaching, 1010. Um, it's been 20 years since that powerful gathering of people. With this new gathering, what would you like to see come from it? Um, and what type of growth did you see in our community in that 20 year span? The last question first. Um, we saw some growth right after the march in that we sent all of those black men to join a black organization that is fighting for our liberation. And we asked all those brothers to join a church, a mosque, a synagogue, a temple, some place where spiritual values and moral values were taught. And we were proud to hear that so many of the black organizations at that time, those young men and older men, joined churches, mosques, synagogues. They joined. And then they went home to try to reconcile differences with members of their family. 25,000 children were up for adoption. And on that day, the announcement was made and later 25,000 of those children were adopted. A million and a half new uh, voters came on the uh, voting uh, uh, rolls and it made a difference in the next election. But whenever we make progress, there's always opposition to every positive thing that we do. In 20 years now, Farrakhan was blotted out of the black colleges and white colleges where in the 80s and early 90s you could always hear Farrakhan in some black institution, some white institution. And even all black organizations, black dentists, black doctors, black lawyers, black social workers, black engineers, there was no such thing as a black organization that Farrakhan was not invited to speak to. All of a sudden, these invitations dried up. And the media that <clears throat> literally made me known, <clears throat> pardon me, as I uh, attempted to help Reverend Jackson in 83 and 84 to run for President of the United States and after he got into the problem with members of the Jewish community and I came to his aid and defended him 
then I became the one that the Jewish community saw as a new black Hitler or a black anti-Semite. And their power and influence in all fields of human endeavor were used to shut me down. I was arrested in England when I was going through there to Nigeria. They stopped me at the airport and wouldn't let me enter England, though I had 14 hours before my flight to Nigeria. And um, if it were not for a beautiful black pilot, that came out when the flight had reached the altitude where they could put it on autopilot. He came out and told me that I, I heard you at Madison Square Garden, Brother Farrakhan, and they gave me a letter and your passport to give to the Nigerian government. In other words, to create a problem for me, but he handed me my passport and he told me what the letter was about, but he was not going to um, give it to the authorities in Nigeria. So there was an effort to, to stop me from the way that I had risen because they threw everything at me. The Donahue show, the this and the that. And every show, you know, it was... Uh, the minister triumphed. So for almost 20 years, many people thought that the minister was actually dead. And a whole new generation grew up, like yourself and like Sister Tahira. And the one thing that the new generation heard was that Farrakhan had something to do with the murder of Brother Malcolm. And during that time, Brother Malcolm was made the hero of the black struggle, more so than Dr. King. They, they put Dr. King to sleep with the I have a dream. <clears throat> and when you make a great thinker, a dreamer, then you put him to the side. And a whole body of knowledge was left. Young people never got a hold to it. Then they made Brother Malcolm, um, they reduced him to a slogan, by any means necessary, ballads or bullets, and you got some of his speeches. And then I, I mentioned to a member of his family, and I asked the question just 48 hours ago. I said, did you know that when Brother Malcolm was assassinated, there were 11 daily newspapers in New York and not one of them had anything good to say about Brother Malcolm. She said, I didn't know that. And I said, did you also know that when your father was assassinated that he was the leading anti-Semite in the country according to the ADL, a position that I occupy now. So the question is, why would the Jewish people who hated Brother Malcolm put up millions of dollars to make a movie on Brother Malcolm if that movie didn't have intended purposes, which was to raise Brother Malcolm, and at the same time, Farrakhan is coming up. And Brother Malcolm was my mentor. He was the one who started me on this journey in Islam. So here we are, Brother Malcolm assassinated at 39, Dr. King assassinated at 39, and Farrakhan was blessed by God to live twice as long as both of those men. So what is the objective? The objective is to use enough propaganda to kill the voice of a man who speaks truth to power 
unashamedly and is known as a wise man, though I'm just a student of the same man that taught Brother Malcolm, Muhammad Ali, and others. I'm just a student, but the student is known all over the world as a wise man, though I never graduated from college, yet kings and rulers have sat at my feet to teach them what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught me. So here I am on your show, which then again gives me a chance to talk to that generation that only knows Farrakhan as that, that dude that had something to do with the death of Malcolm X. And so it's given me a chance to beat back propaganda so that what is in my mouth of value can be heard by the most valuable generation that we've produced. So I've, I've said a lot. There was good in what the Million Man March initially produced. But now we're in the worst condition that we've ever been in. Because even though there was gang violence in 95, starting in the late 70s, early 80s, from the US government, bringing in drugs through the West Coast with uh, Freeway Rick. And Freeway Rick did not know that he was being used as an agent for the Bush administration. And they brought the drugs in and our consumer dollars were going out into the pockets of those who wanted to stop the rise of socialism in Central and South America, using drugs to inflict us, then gangs and guns. And the movies that portrayed us all over the world before the Million Man March, Colors, Boys in the Hood, Menace to Society, they all were showing us with guns and bandanas and in a savage kind of way. So they were preparing a war against black youth. So in this 20 year period, the war on black youth reached the zenith. They said it was a war on drugs, but in 1995, while we were in Washington, Reverend Jackson spoke at the Million Man March and he mentioned that at the same time we were having that demonstration in Congress, they were arguing over the jail sentence between those who would use crack as opposed to those who use powdered cocaine. So under Bill Clinton and Hillary too, more black men were put in prison than at any other time. Now we're talking about what has happened since the Million Man March. The prison industrial complex became uh, what you call uh, Wall Street business now. And the prisons began to become privatized. And during that time, the rap of the 80s and the early 90s that was edutainment with um, a public enemy putting intelligent lyrics. And then came N.W.A. and straight out of Compton, what they call gangster rap. But it was gangster rap in a sense when he said F the police. That was, that was going too far. Ice-T, you know, came out, kill the pigs. So now uh, Ice-T got a television show that he's a police. And I, 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 told, uh, I told Cube the other day, I said, man, after seeing the movie, I didn't know you were such a heavy lyricist. But because he was so brilliant as a lyricist, they took him out of the rap game, put him in movies where white folk can write scripts for him. And it's the same with the kings of comedy. 
when my children told me, Daddy, you got to see this Kings of Comedy. And I saw Cedric the Entertainer, Hugh Lee, uh, Steve, um, Harvey, and um, Bernie Mac. And those brothers were cooking, man, giving us knowledge or every joke. Some of it was pretty raw, but <laughs> I enjoyed them brothers. But then Fox Television said, we can't have this. They waking up the blacks. So we take Hughley, give him a, a show. We take Cedric, give him a show. We take um, Steve Harvey, give him a show. Take um, Bernie Mac, give him a show. And every time you get a show, which is, is Jewish owned now, they put a writer there. And the writer is Jewish. And the writer is always writing things that take you down from the mountaintop of black intelligence and, and militants that you were doing when you were away from television. Everything is part of a game. And like they did with Dave Chappelle, you know, Dave is a great brother. And then one day he's making uh, a part of his television show. He comes back in his, um, uh, what do you call that? The um, place where they stay. Uh, the, trailer, the, trailer. the trailer. And there's a, 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 a dress on the, uh, on the wall for him to wear. And he said, what's this? He said, oh, that's going to be so funny. Just put that on. See, they're promoting the feminizing of the black male. And so they offered Wesley $15 million to play a woman. They had a strong black man, Buster, not, um, Vin Rames. Vin Rames. Yeah, Vin Rames. And they had a scene with him, you know, as, as a homosexual man. Uh, a, a man that did homosexual acts. They're producing things. And now here we are, 20 years later, we talking about justice or us, and we've got a feminized male and a masculinized female, and you've got same-sex marriage, and you've got drugs, guns, gangs. The... Um, the um, trade schools that were once in the inner cities of every city, all gone. Mm -hmm. Then you had factories in the inner cities that gave unskilled labor a chance to make a decent living. This, they're overseas, all the factories closed. So we are being herded into an avenue of social savagery where now we're killing each other over nothing. So the, the condition now is worse than ever. So we got a war now on two fronts mm -hmm. because you got police killing us wholesale too. Then you got soldiers coming back from a war in Afghanistan and Iraq and they are messed up and there's no jobs for them. They are sleeping under bridges, but they know how to kill. That's what they've been trained to do. So now you've got the inner cities imploding with us against us. And so my brother, this is the most dangerous time of all. And that's why I'm asking us, join me in Washington on 10, 10, 15. One day can't heal all the wounds, but one day can start a process that the day after will be more important than the day of. And what is after? If you come out to the church tonight, um, Brother Eric, um, it's Eric, right? Yes, sir. Uh, tonight you will um, hear, I'm asking young people, don't believe that Dr. King was just a dreamer. Don't allow 
these people to tell us about our brother and make him less than what he really is and was. He was a revolutionary thinker and that's why they assassinated him. So if you begin to listen to some of his lectures in the last two years of his life and the lecture that he gave the night before he was killed. He was calling for blacks to redistribute the pain that we are feeling. Now we're in pain right now. You're in pain, I'm in pain, she's in pain. Just looking at what's happening to our people. But Martin King said, let's redistribute the pain. He said, we don't have to fire no guns and use no Molotov cocktails. Elijah Muhammad said, we don't have to do that. Our unity is more powerful than a hydrogen or atomic bomb. And what did you want us to do, Dr. King? In 68, our purchasing power was $30 billion. 2015, it's 1.1 to 1.5 trillion dollars. So what are we spending our money on that we as individuals are poor, but collectively we are rich. And so we are like a carcass, a dead people, and all the vultures are over us sucking the wealth of our community to build their communities. You have Koreans, we want some hair, we want our nails done. Unbelievable. So here they are. We're giving them the money, they take it back to Koreatown. Mm -hmm. The Palestinians are in our community. They are giving us whatever they have to give us, but they're taking from us. And they don't leave no money in the black community. They take it back to their own community. Nobody is showing respect for us because we are not showing respect for ourselves. So this is the big job now that we have 20 years later, but it starts with you and me and us and knowledge. Knowledge of self brings self-love. Knowledge of self not only brings self-love, it brings self-respect. Knowledge of love brings self-determination. Knowledge of self means that I will not walk by a black man's store and boycott that to spend my money with somebody else. Mm -hmm. So then the money stays in our community at least once, twice, and we start building institutions. So we got a big job, brother. And I'm, I know that the generation to do this job is not the elders. We as elders have messed it up. We have become whores. We want the money of this world. And anytime we start something progressive, all the enemy has to do is offer us some money and all of a sudden the zeal to fight for a better life for our young people is gone. So our young people have gone to hell, but we sent them there because we don't pay attention to our young people. Our pastors don't care nothing about the young they don't invite the young. They don't go after the young because the young don't have money. So the young look at us and they say, them niggas are pimps. Pimping my grandmother, pimping my mother. So I ain't going to church, ain't nothing there. They see the hypocrisy of those of us in leadership who preach one thing and do something else. So our youth are out there almost on an island by themselves and they need to hear the voice that white America cut them off from. So the Bible in closing of that page says, in that day there will be a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, but a famine for the hearing of the word of God. So for these last 20 years, my voice been silent. All these pseudo cats out here talking, but they saying nothing. Talking, but they not dealing with the problem specifically or with the wickedness of our government, particularly. We've sold out. 
give me a job, give me something to do in college, and I become a mayor, I become a congressman, I become this and that, but I can't do nothing to change the condition of my people, but I'm at least living comfortably. And so when I die, I can pass on to my children. What? A little bank account, a house with a note, a nice Mercedes Benz that you still struggling to pay for. This is all we got to offer you, Eric, to offer you, my sister. Is that what our life should be? Shouldn't we be offering you a better way of life, a way out of all this madness? We failed you. And that's why today our youth are in the shape that they're in. And that's why I'm blessed to be here with you. So I can talk to the youth. We can gather the youth because they are the real hope of us along with the rappers. Mm -hmm. That's why you see me talking to rappers. I don't talk to rappers just to tell you how great you are. Mm -hmm. I tell you your responsibility. When you've got the ears of the young all over the world, what are you giving them? What are you teaching them? You are their leader, whether you accept that responsibility or not. You are the leader. So teach them. How do they I'll respond the, to that? They love it. They're saying to me, you're right, Farrakhan. I said, I put the wisdom there. You take it and put it in that way that you know. I don't mind if you cuss a little because I let some go sometime myself. Hey, Pops is 1987.com. Last season, you were in a very, very interesting but privileged position. You got to play with four out of, the, let's say, the top ten NBA players in the world. Right. Kyrie, LeBron, Westbrook, and KD. Mm -hmm. What's it like? What was it like playing with all four of them in one season? Like, what are some things you pick up? Break it down for us. I mean, you know, especially with LeBron, I mean, just coming in and see how he work every day. You know, the first one in the gym. Uh, how he take care of his body. I was, that's why I was actually being around. Uh, you know, we go out to eat, things like that. 